Hello, welcome to this video of uh, exploring the killing of sacred cows. Um, there's going to be a bit of talk about uh, Linux desktop distributions, Trust, Red Hat, Debian, other projects in the open source world, and thoughts about what it means to be a constituent of an open source project. Now, just to clear up some uh, definitions, because I think we're going to need some definitions in order for this to make any sense. Uh, a contributor to an open source project is somebody who is contributing basically material goods, things like code, uh, money, documentation, that sort of thing. Um, a leader or owner of an open source pro project are basically the ones that get to decide what the project's priorities are, what its culture is, what it considers to be acceptable in terms of contributions. The third set is more interesting and less explored, which is the constituents of a project. These are essentially users that are not necessarily contributing, but are the target audience that the, the project itself and its leadership attempts to um, develop its project for. Okay, so the reason why I make these definitions is because there's a lot of confusion in the open source world about when a, a company, let's say like Red Hat uh, or Canonical or System76 or name your local, you know, uh, hardware manufacturer or software manufacturer of choice when you are generally considered a constituent of the pro projects that they produce and whether they are indeed listening to you. Um, I was involved in the Ubuntu pro project for a very long time and it was not clear in the Ubuntu pro project when you became a member, uh, whether that entitled you to help make decisions about the direction of the Ubuntu project, and whether you had a right to um, ask for your specific problems to be fixed. Um, this is basically the whole game, right? Is that you need companies, uh, well, not just companies, but labor that makes things, should we say, to listen to the people who that they would conceivably make software for. Um, but there's a misconception because most open source users are not constituents. Uh, they never have been constituents. It is uh, a bit of an imagined set of rights that you just because you use Debian, that you are a constituent of the Debian, i.e. the Debian project specifically targets your needs and your particular issues. Um, that's mostly not true. There are times when sometimes you can get your issues highlighted and some programmer or leader will um, essentially uh, back your particular issue and then get it fixed. But that's more of a sort of like incidental um, situation. And that's where the vast majority of open source users find themselves. They find themselves aligned with uh, projects, but not fully constituents of or contributors of. I mean, to be fair, we can't all be contributors to every single project. Um, it's just not going to happen. Um, but like we're definitely not uh, constituents, right? The vast, vast majority of us are not uh, the target audience, really. And if, and if you look at every, every open source pro project, whether it's GNOME with like the charity stuff, whether it's Debian with like the structured, uh, sysadmin focus, or whether it's companies like Red Hat, they all have particular alignments. And then a lot of their development work we kind of latch onto because the, that aligns very well with our own particular needs uh, or the needs of the people who we're trying to serve because some of us actually deliver desktop Linux to other people as well. 
but these organizations are not actually serving us. It, that's kind of a mirage. Um, they're serving th- either themselves or, or more, more likely they're serving their specific constituencies. Sometimes I don't think pro- projects really have documented or have digested well who their constituents are anyway. Like the, a lot of them are um, confused about who it is that they're serving. I know this is a particular issue that we grapple with in Inkscape is you know, who are we serving anyway? Are we serving uh, people who contribute code? Are we serving um, designers who like are professionals? Are we serving uh, school kids? You know, who who is our target demographic and, and, and what is our responsibility to them? Um, you know, and then again, who are the people who are just merely aligned with the project and who use it without ever, you know, interacting with us at all? Um I understand that this, but by the way, is entirely rambly. So we're just going to see what kind of video pops out at the other end of this uh, thought pipe. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is is that uh, you shouldn't really trust uh, any open source pro- projects at all. Uh, we're in some very early days when it comes to a, a free and open source project governance simply because a lot of projects haven't really put a lot of thought into defining who their constituents are, defining what uh, volunteerism targets, what their company policies target, and also accepting the fact that there's going to be incidental uh, users who will ask for um, work to be done and who you can't serve because they're not your constituents. They're just people who just happen to be using it the same time, as cruel as that sounds, right, that you have a whole bunch of users who are not people who you're serving, um, it, it is kind of the, the, the matrix of relationships that we have. And um, I, I, a lot of the time in, in, in my uh, social media, you'll see me coming back to this specific point that relationships matter. They matter an awful lot. Okay, so to get back to uh, Red Hat for a second, I think um, the recent uh, news from Red Hat is not so much about their, um, like the technical situation that they have to do with packaging and source code and stuff. I don't even think it's about legal specifics about the GPL. Sorry, Bradley. Um, I think it's relationships. I honestly do. I think... um, you know, the, the, the relation, the, the, the non-existent or bad relationship between, um, the CentOS, uh, replacement projects and Red Hat, um, kind of shows you that, like, the, cl- clearly that the, these, the, the, the CentOS replacements are not constituents of Red Hat. Red Hat doesn't have to care at all about serving them at all. Um, but there was a, there was an implied or assumed set of, an implied relationship there that um, unfortunately doesn't doesn't exist. Um, we th- would think that you, you would be aligned with, with, like Red Hat would be aligned with uh, producing these things, but it's clear that that's not the case. Um, Red Hat can change its alignment at any time, and it doesn't necessarily mean that Red Hat's bad, but it means that you you were mistaken to trust a company uh, to continue to be aligned with you. When they are not, when you don't have a relationship with them at all. Um, now, here here is a huge caveat. So, um, Red Hat does this thing, and it has for very very many years. And it's called creating space, and um, it's something that if you talk to Red Hat people, they will t- tell you about just how much freedom they've been given by the organization to uh, develop things in the free software world to target constituencies that might not even be in Red Hat's customer base um, to help the whole ecosystem of the free software and software movement as a whole uh, to progress, especially on the desktop. Um, so it's quite clear that like Red Hat has been doing interesting things when it comes to investing in free software. Um, and I think it's invested in you know, research and development of the technical aspects, but also I think it's been investing in the community aspects. And there are definitely people who understand those dynamics. Um, but I'm not entirely clear that IBM itself can maintain that space. Like, I think the pressures are harder. And um, 
that space that that managers, good managers, that or, or that can allow their employees to have space to do their work in the effective way without having to be micromanaged. I think that that gets harder, especially the larger the the organization. This is why personally, I I tend to mistrust organizations that are very very large. And I understand the heroic work of managers who manage to create positive spaces in very large organizations. I think it's um, uh, unique to have such a situation. Um, but it is in, entirely possible, right, that you would have an organization like Red, Red Hat still contribute positively to free software because it has these spaces and also, um, like, fail to... to keep its alignment with a bunch of other relationships that it didn't sort of kind of maybe had um, and why breaking those relationships by realigning itself would cause upset in in the community um, it's it's one of these like really interesting things where it's like people like to paint all bad all good or whatever but it, a lot of this stuff is just mechanical it's just human beings like organizing their relationships, organizing what they know about uh, the way other people are going to behave. Um, and, and I just want to reiterate, you absolutely should not trust any open source pro- project to continue to be aligned with your personal needs unless you have a relationship with them. It's like... And if you're an open source project um, leader... You absolutely should be thinking about this. You should be thinking about how to create relationships with the people who you want to serve. Because if you do not have relationships with people, I do not see how you can effectively serve them, right? Unless you're like really, really good at guessing. Um, you absolutely have to go out to, into the community of people who you want to be your constituents and get them on board, get them involved. Whether that means getting them to pay for stuff, whether that means getting them to report issues, or whether that just means talking to you. Um, you. You cannot maintain a situation where users are failing to become constituents, failing to become contributors, failing to be involved, failing to be able to make decisions, and ultimately to keep projects aligned with the um, needs of the average on-the-ground user. Okay, that's enough rambling for one day. We'll see if my video editor can cope with this. Uh, Thank you for watching, and uh, I'll see you when I've got a more productive video.